Hello everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Depending upon when you are watching this video lecture. In the earlier sessions related to capital budgeting, we discussed about crucial techniques, including net present value technique, profitability index, or desirability factor, and computation of IRR, internal rate of return. All of them are DCF techniques which consider time value of money and there are some techniques which do not consider time value of money. We can call them as traditional techniques or non-discounting techniques. So let us also go through these techniques before we go on to solve some bigger questions. These traditional techniques broadly can be classified into two of them. One is a payback period and second one is ARR, accounting rate of return, sometimes called average rate of return also. First let us focus on payback period. Name itself indicates payback period is simply the time that is required to recover the initial cash outflow. It is the most common and uh, practically used technique by even those who are not very well versed with the financial management scientific principles. Imagine if a businessman has invested 1 lakh rupees and if yearly he can get 25,000 return, that means how many years it will take for him to recoup his original investment. 4 years. If you ask even a small businessman also, he will be able to answer this question very comfortably. That is what is payback period. How much time it takes to pay back? Pay back what? Pay back the initial investment which is initial cash outlay or initial cash outflow. Of course, each of the techniques we should definitely know what they are representing. NPV gives us money amount and IRR gives us a percentage of return whereas profitability index is just a number it is neither a money amount nor a percentage it is just an index number so those techniques have their own selection criteria which we already discussed but now the payback period it's a period means it is expressed in time period means naturally the answer will be in the form of number of years how many years it will take to recover the original initial cash outflow is called as payback period of course payback period can be calculated simply if the cash flows, the annual cash flows are uniform. That does not require a big formula and all. Just now the example what we have taken. 1 lakh rupees was the initial investment. Each year 25,000 rupees was coming in as a cash inflow. So what did we do to get the answer as 4 years? 1 lakh divided by 25,000. So that is the payback period. Total initial capital investment in our example 1 lakh divided by annual expected after tax cash flows net cash flows which anyway we know how to calculate so once we have the after tax net cash flows and if that is divided if the initial capital investment is divided by that annual net cash flow then we get payback period in our example 1 lakh rupees divided by 25000 rupees 4 years is going to be the payback period but when can we use this formula only when the cash flows are uniform. If the cash flows are not uniform, with this formula cannot be used. There we need to find out cumulative cash flows. We will come to that later. But before that, let us see this example 4. Imagine a project costs 20 lakhs rupees and yields annually a profit of 3 lakhs rupees after depreciation at the rate of 12.5% straight line method but before tax 50%. So we don't have the cash flows directly after depreciation but before tax profits we have 
So naturally, what should be the first step? We should calculate cash flows. What is given, we have to observe carefully. What is given is not cash flows. What is given is profit after depreciation, but before tax. So first of all, profit before tax is the amount that is given 3 lakhs. Deduct the tax, which is 50%. So 1 lakh 50,000 if you deduct it. Profit after tax is 1 lakh 50,000. And we know how to get cash flows when you have the profit after tax. Just we have to add back depreciation. Depreciation is not given directly, but it is given as 12.5% straight line method. So 12.5% has to be applied on the original investment. That's what is straight line method. So 12.5% on 20 lakhs. Depreciation is going to be how much? 20 lakhs multiplied with 12.5%. 2 lakhs 50,000 is depreciation. Add that back to the profit after tax. Automatically what we get is total cash flow that is going to be generated each year. So that is the cash flow calculation. We know this already. And initial investment is how much? 20 lakhs. So payback period is how much? Simple. Because formula wise, initial investment 20 lakhs. Divided by annual after tax net cash flows, 4 lakhs. That means this project will take 5 years to pay back its original investment. That is a payback period, 5 years. That's all. When can we use this type of formula? Only when the cash flows are uniform. In this example, they are uniform. Each year 4 lakhs, 4 lakhs, 4 lakhs only is coming. So we can use this formula. That is payback period, 5 years. But what if the cash flows are not uniform? Then we cannot use the formula directly. There we need to do little bit more computations. What is the computation required there is? We need to calculate cumulative cash inflows each year. So normal cash flows, anyway we have to calculate. After that we have to calculate cumulative cash flows. And payback period will be lying between some of the two years wherein the cumulative cash flows have exceeded the initial cash outlay. Let us look at this example 5. Say XYZ Limited is analyzing a project requiring an initial cash outlay of 2 lakhs rupees. This is initial cash outlay expected to generate cash inflows as follows. Cash inflows are already given of course in many problems in exams we have to calculate them. Doesn't matter. That just adds one more step. But Cash inflows are known, but they are not uniform. So can we just use the formula like earlier? No, we cannot. So what we should do? We should calculate cumulative cash flows. Cumulative cash flows means, of course, for the first year, 80,000 only. Second year, 80,000 plus 60,000, 1 lakh 40,000. Third year, 1 lakh 40 already is there up to two years, plus third year's cash flows of 60,000. That is 2 lakhs. Luckily, we got the payback period already directly, that is 3 years, when the cumulative cash flows are already equal to the initial cash outlay. That's it. After that, what happens is immaterial. That is one of the limitations of payback period. It only considers the cash flows till the payback actually happens. After that, fourth year is there. Imagine if there is fifth year, sixth year, seventh year also, we don't care. Already we know from this calculation that the payback period is 3 years. Why? Because by the end of three years, the project is generating a cash flows of cash inflows of 2 lakhs, which is already equal to the initial cash outlay. That's what we want. So three years is the payback period. Directly, we can find it out. So this is where the cumulative cash flows are equal to the initial cash outlay. But still, that is also not something generally which is going to be so directly possible to be calculated because what happens is usually cumulative cash flows will not be exactly equal to the initial cash outlay. They will be lying somewhere between two years. So let us take such type of situation. Imagine if the initial cash outlay is not 2 lakhs but 2 lakhs 5000 then what is the payback period? Is it three years? Can we say that? No. Because till for third year only 2 lakhs was recouped. Can we say four years? No. That also we cannot say because it has already exceeded the 2,5,000 that is required. So 
definitely payback period is going to be somewhere between three to four years. And of course, when we have to calculate something which lies between two things, we can use the technique of interpolation. So definitely payback period is three plus years, but definitely not four years. Somewhere between three to four years is payback period. So three plus something, something what? Logical thing. Here already by end of third year, two lakhs is recovered. So what is the amount which is yet to be recovered? 5,000 because initial investment is 5,000. Sorry, 5,000. Divided by what is the spread between these two cash flows? 20,000. So out of 20,000 cash flows that are generated in the fourth year, how much time it will take to generate 5,000? Simple logic, we don't need any formula there also. It can be converted into formula, but still. So, first of all, between which two years payback period lies, that has to be calculated. That is 3 for sure. 3 and 4 between that payback period lies. So, it is definitely 3 plus. 3 plus what? 3 plus, we can say, what is the initial cash outlay? minus cash flow of let us say cf1 means cash flow of the year which is the earlier year divided by cf2 minus cf1 like that you can convert that into formula also if you want otherwise it is just logical calculation already 2 lakhs is covered how much is yet to be covered? That remaining amount is in the numerator. Divided by what is the cash flow of this particular period? That is, sorry, this is cumulative cash flow and cumulative cash flow. So, this is, uh, we can say just instead of taking all the cumulative things, let us say the cash flow of cumulative cash flows of year 1 is 2 lakhs not cash flows cumulative cash flows then we can take cumulative cash flows of year 2 minus cumulative cash flows of year 1 year 1 is the earlier year year 2 is the latter year in this case cf1 ccf1 is 2 lakhs ccf2 is 2 lakhs 20000 so initial cash outlay is 2 lakh 5000 minus 2 lakhs that is 5000 ccf2 minus ccf1 is 20000 that is in the denominator so if at all formula has to be framed we can frame the perfect formula like this Initial cash outlay minus cumulative cash flows till year, till the earlier year, CCF1 let us call it, divided by cumulative cash flows of next year minus cumulative cash flows of this year. Or alternatively, what are the actual cash flows of next year also can be taken in the denominator, either way. So it is only for our convenience we are framing this formula. Simply, logic if you understand, was already 2 lakhs is covered by the end of third year, still we need to cover 5,000. But the fourth year is giving 20,000. How much time proportionately it will take within the fourth year to cover 5,000? If the entire fourth year gives 20,000, how much time it will take to cover 5,000? 5, 5,000 divided by 20,000. So, one fourth year, 0.25. So, we can say 3.25 years. Years that is. That's it. That is the payback period in that particular case. So, there, if at all we have to use the formula, so, year 1, whatever is this year, initial year, Y1 plus initial cash outlay minus CCF1 divided by CCF2 minus CCF1. That can be taken as formula for the computation of payback period when the cash flows are not uniform and when the payback period is lying between any of the two years as given in the question and as given in the cash flow pattern. That's it. That is payback period and some advantages of payback period are that it is easy to compute particularly when the cash flows are uniform and usually it gives a very simple and quick estimate of the time needed for the recoupment of the original cash invested and the length of the payback period can also serve as an estimate of the project's risk that is one more advantage here. Normally the other things like NPV, IRR don't directly give us any idea about what is the risk involved in the project. If an NPV of a project is, uh, let us say, 5 lakhs rupees, okay, fine, 5 lakhs rupees, so what? Is it risky? It is less, is less risky. That aspect is not covered, not understood easily by NPV. 
IRR also gives a percentage return that also does not really tell us about anything about risk involved in the project. However, in case of payback period, we can understand the risk of the project also, which is inherent in the payback period itself. Imagine your payback period for a particular project is 8 years. We can definitely say it is a riskier project than something else which gives you a payback period of 5 years. So the longer the payback period, riskier the project will be. Why is that? Naturally, when you go more and more into the future, it becomes more and more uncertain. What we can predict or estimate about 5 years is more likely to be closer to reality than what we estimate about 8 years. Simple logic. That is why longer payback period projects will be considered to be risky and that risk also is inherently depicted by the payback period. That is one of the advantages of this uh, particular technique. Of course, some types of projects will have very longer payback period. They are risky, no doubt. But at the same time, the organizations can also look at other techniques like NPV, IRR. For example, just for understanding purposes, say a project with a huge investment, something like Ramoji Film City in Hyderabad, huge investment. Payback period for that would be not less than 10 years. In fact, more than that. It is risky, that much of investment. It gives returns, but very slowly, over a period of time, it takes longer time to get the returns. So, certain projects like that will have longer, longer payback periods. They are risky, generally the infrastructure projects, like even building of national highways or even for that matter, metro projects. These are all uh, going to have longer payback periods. They are risky projects. But yes, over a period of time, the kind of cash flows that they might generate will give a positive NPV. So, the bigger organizations will go for such projects and they will execute them because ultimately the shareholders wealth is getting benefited. But comparison of two different projects for the same company is different. Comparison of projects for one company and another company is different. Let us say we cannot compare a project in a software company with a project in a construction industry. Both are projects. Software company projects may have a shorter period of time, maybe months sometimes. At the maximum few years, two, three years max. But construction projects are not like that. Infrastructure projects are not like that. They'll have longer time duration for constructing them also. And more than that, recouping the investment will take much, much longer period of time because they, they give smaller returns consistently over a long period of time. You take the example of highways where crores of rupees are invested by even private companies like GMR. But they don't get the returns so quickly. They, they take a lot of time to recoup their investment. That is the nature of the business. That is different. But within an organization, if they want to compare, if there is a project which gives uh, the payback within 10 years, and if there is another project for the same company where the payback period is 15 years, naturally, the project with 10 years payback period is considered to be less risky than the project that is going to be completed or that is going to be giving the returns back the investment back in 15 years. So, yes, payback period is one of the indicators of risk also. Longer the payback period, riskier the project is. That is one of the advantages of this technique, which the other techniques directly <coughs> do not have. Limitations always will be there for any technique. Major limitation is, first of all, it is ignoring the time value of money, which is the biggest limitation. Time value of money is reality. When time value of money is reality and you are ignoring the reality and doing all these calculations, they do not tell us anything. So, ignoring time value of money is the very big limitation of payback period. Of course, this can be, this limitation can be overcome. How? By calculating discounted payback period. That will nullify this limitation. That is actually a better technique. Though, that is also a payback period. The way we compute is same. Instead of taking the normal cash flows, here, the annual cash flows are taken directly as they are without discounting them. Just one more step is added there where you discount the cash flows also. That means you get discounted cash flows, then you get cumulative discounted cash flows. So, by doing so, we can compute the discounted payback period that will eliminate this limitation of the normal payback period. So, that is why discounted payback period is a modern technique, scientific technique which considers time value of money. Whereas the original normal traditional payback period does not consider time value of money. That is the limitation of payback period.
that is one thing second big limitation is that just now as we discussed it ignores the cash flows after the payback period let us say payback already happened at the end of third year in this example third three years is the payback period so what are the cash flows in fourth year 20000 what if they are 1 lakh doesn't matter what if they are 10000 still doesn't matter what if they are 5 lakhs still we don't care so we completely ignore whatever the cash flows that are coming after the payback period is already over that is a very big limitation because the cash flows which are accruing to the organization after the payback period also are real they are also going to come really how can you ignore that reality so two big realities payback period is ignoring one is time value of money and second one is the cash flows generated after the payback period is completed and usually the payback period places much emphasis on the short payback periods because payback period <coughs> what is the selection criteria if you see naturally shorter the payback period better it is so if there are two projects with all the other things being same if it is if one project is having a shorter payback period that will be selected the projects with longer payback period will be rejected but the point is maybe the projects with longer payback period have better return and we are ignoring that we are only considering quickly quickly i have to get my money back okay you get your money back but what is the extra money that you are generating afterwards the payback period technique does not consider that that is why there is a risk of selecting very less profitable projects just because they have short payback periods and ignoring long-term projects may not be always that profitable so payback period only considers one way we can say risk of the project rather than the return that is generated from the project which is also not correct whenever any selection has to be made both risk and return both have to be taken into consideration payback period only considers risk aspect because of which it selects only the projects with shorter payback periods and ignores the projects with longer payback periods though they may be profitable though they may be giving a huge return still this technique ignores them so that is why definitely not a technique that can be straight away used for major decision making in the big organizations no but it gives an idea to the organization and management that okay boss this is the time period what i am looking at within which i can get back my investment that's all only to that extent directly decisions generally are not made by using the technique of payback period because of the limitations that it has but still as we already discussed it is simple to calculate easy to understand a lot of times it so happens the top management of the companies generally are not much aware of these financial things uh, so they will understand these things easily payback period is something if you say okay boss this is the time period within which we are getting back our investment you can get back our investment within three years like that if you tell oh is it that's a good thing that they will tell okay it is giving this much return how much return it is giving this much percentage return it is giving they will understand so these percentages they will understand easily also the payback period they will understand easily that is the good point about it even then bigger professionally managed organizations only consider a payback period as just one of the additional calculations rather than the decision making criteria itself smaller organizations uh, less uh, uh, financially literate people will go with payback period as uh, their decision making criteria because it is simple that's it that is the technique of payback period which is a non dcf technique as a continuation of this there is one more that is called a payback reciprocal uh, simple we don't have to separately calculate once again payback reciprocal payback recipro reciprocal means what reverse of that so one divided by payback period is called as payback reciprocal that's it so when you know how to calculate payback period payback reciprocal also you can calculate one divided by payback period whatever the payback period is that is in the denominator one is in the numerator and this is a percentage expression so it will be multiplied with 100 so that is the payback reciprocal we don't have to separately once again know another formula for it you should know one formula that is payback period formula and methodology of calculating payback period calculation that's enough one divided by that will give us payback reciprocal automatically so like in the same example what we have taken earlier or another example which is given here let us take this let us say a project requires initial investment of 20,000 rupees and it will give an annual cash flow of 4,000 rupees so first thing first what is payback period 20,000 divided by 4 that is how much 5 years so 5 years is the payback period and payback reciprocal if we want 
1 divided by 5 into 100. That means on an average each year how much return this project is generating? 20%. For that we don't need any special formula again. Uh, because this formula anyway cannot be used when the cash flows are not uniform. So simply payback reciprocal one formula is 1 divided by payback period multiplied with 100. But expression is important. Payback reciprocal is a percentage. That is not just some uh, number. It is a percentage expression. So payback period is a time period expression. Payback reciprocal is a percentage expression. NPV is amount that is in rupee terms, money terms. IRR is again a percentage expression. Profitability index or desirability factor is just a number. It's an index, that's all. It's an indicator. It has no denomination. It, it doesn't have any prefix or suffix. So that is one type of number where it does not require any prefix or suffix. So that is the expression and uh, selection criteria also for each of the techniques is different. You should be very clear with these things conceptually. Each technique, how to use that and what is the expression of that and how this can be interpreted for actually selecting the projects in the real investment decision making. The chapter itself is investment decision making. So that is about payback period and payback reciprocal. Average rate of return is something which is different once again from all the other techniques. One difference between all other techniques we are discussing and ARR is that ARR takes accounting profits into consideration whereas all other techniques that we are discussing will take cash flows into consideration. So for all the techniques whether it is NPV or profitability index or IRR or payback period or payback reciprocal in all these cases what we are considering are cash inflows, cash flows not accounting profits and we know difference between accounting profits and cash flows already. But ARR uses accounting profits. So that is altogether completely on one side of all the techniques on one side and ARR on the other side. We will come to that later. NPV we already calculated for all these things and we should know these computations to be done very very thoroughly and very comfortably. IRR also we have discussed earlier how to calculate IRR. Now one more DCF technique which is an extension of the payback period technique is discounted payback period. This is discounted payback period. So what is the additional big thing about this discounted payback period? Actually nothing much. Only difference between payback period method and discounted payback period is in case of payback period, we will consider cash flows. We don't discount them. We consider cumulative cash flows if required. Now, in case of discounted payback period, we will consider discounted cash flows and discounted cumulative cash flows. So, the accumulation of discounted cash flows is discounted cumulative cash flows. Remaining things are all same. And the way we have to calculate and uh, using the interpolation technique, all of the other things are all same. So, it is basically a kind of uh, extension to the payback period technique only but only thing is payback period does not take time value of money into consideration whereas discounted payback period takes time value of money also into consideration. So let us look at an example here. 30,000 rupees is the cash outlay for a project with an annual cash inflows of 6,000. Normal payback period is very simple. Normal payback period is what? 5 years. 30,000 divided by 6,000. 6,000 means here average cash flows which are uniform but here this is uh, going to be not the correct or scientific approach why because certainly the time value of money is not considered in this five years calculation so what is a better way of doing this using discounted payback period so let us use the discounted payback period method for the same situation but here we cannot use uniform cash flows. Why? Because the discounted cash flows will not be 6000 each year. Because the discount rate changes each year. Discounted cash flows also change each year. That is one thing we have to understand very clearly. So what are going to be the requirements here? Just like any other normal DCF technique, we need year and we need first normal cash flows. Then we need PVIF. We will get discounted cash flows. Then 
cumulative discounted cash flows. So, in this case, we are not calculating NPV. So, we don't need year 0 because that is the amount to be recouped, initial investment. So, that calculation has to be kept aside. So, 30,000 leave it aside. But actual cash flows are going to be how much? 1, 2, 3, how many years we are talking about? 5 years, right? Yeah. 4, 5. Cash flows are going to be 6,000 each year. Same cash flows each year. PVIF, here we are assuming a discount rate or the cost of capital or required rate of return of 15%. So at the rate of 15%, PVIFs are how much? 1 divided by 1.15, that divided by 1.15. And that divided by 1.15, that divided by 1.15, that divided by 1.15. So, you should know how to calculate them. If there is any big difficulty about it, which should not be there, you can refer to the tables, they which are there in the book. In the examinations, generally, these will be given. But again, if not given, we cannot cry and we cannot ask for books, which most probably will not be available in all the examination centers. So, such a risk should be avoided. So, it's a simple thing. You should be able to calculate it using a normal simple calculator and just put some pen on paper. You will be able to easily get these numbers. Now, discounted cash flows, you know, just multiplication of cash flows with the PVIF. Multiply all of them separately. Do it on paper. Then, cumulative discounted cash flows. For the first year, the same amount will be there. Second year, what are the earlier cumulative cash flows plus that year's cash flows will be there. Same thing for next year, same thing for next year, same thing for next year. Means cumulative cash flows are going to be like this 5217, then 9754, 13,699, 17,130, 20,113. Here, it is not going to happen in this five years period because 30,000 is the initial cash outlay. It is not yet recouped. So, we need to extend this. There is no option. We are calculating the period itself. So, let us take 10 years instead of 5 years. And uh, you have to recalculate these things. But for me, it is okay because it is just copy paste. So, formula are same. But you have to calculate manually. Yeah, now it has come. 30,000 somewhere. In the 10th year, it has come. So, Naturally, the discounted payback period will be somewhere between 9th year and 10th year. So, again, same technique of interpolation. 9 years plus only will be the discounted payback period for sure. But how much is in which initial outlay to be covered? 30,000. Minus of CCF1. CCF1. That is this much. Divided by CCF2 minus CCF1. So, here we can call DCCF2 minus DCCF1. This minus earlier one. And so naturally, it should be equal to the same 1483. So, 1370 is supposed to be covered. But in that 10th year, the discounted cash flows are 1483. So, how much time it takes? 1370 divided by 1483. 0.92 years. Plus, this is 9 plus. 9 plus this. So, 9.92 years is what? The discounted payback period. So, discounted payback period is coming. 9.92 years. Approximately 10 years we can say. So, if you look at normal payback period, it looks like only 5 years. You are able to recoup your investment in 5 years, which is absolutely wrong. No, you are not going to recoup your investment in 5 years because 30,000 you are spending now, 6,000 is coming in future. The present value of the 6,000 that comes in future will not be 6,000, it will be less than that. That point of time value of money was ignored by the original payback period technique. That is why better technique is discounted payback period technique. In this case, at 15% rate, the payback period is coming, discounted payback period is coming to be around 9.92 years. It is not 5 years. That is the difference between normal payback period and discounted payback period. That is the 
one of the other techniques and other things like reinvestment assumption multiple irr these things we already discussed modified irr we'll come to that later that is altogether a different thing so other than the modified irr and arr all the other techniques in this chapter we discussed already what are those npv profitability index irr payback period payback reciprocal and discounted payback period all of them have been discussed and in the earlier session we already discussed about why there will be conflict or contradiction of ranking between two projects when we analyze them with the npv method and irr method why that will happen because of various reasons it can happen one of the reasons could be scale of the project itself that is one thing that is one of the reasons another reason could be major reason actually will be the timing of the project time disparity the projects which are having their cash flows more skew, skewed towards the initial years will have more irr than the projects with the cash flows which are occurring at the latter parts of the time period so the timing of the cash flows is also one more thing unequal lives is altogether again a different discussion that also we'll discuss later so normally for the regular computations and all the regular problems to be done which are there in the examination conditions with all the special things and exceptional cases apart we can solve all the regular normal questions which have been given in the examinations earlier and which can be given similar to that in the examinations special cases of course we will discuss them separately that is all also important but relatively less important most of the important things which are required have already been discussed that is the crux of this uh, chapter investment decision making or capital budgeting now let us move on to solving some of the problems here which are there illustration 15 this was also a past examination question alpha company is considering the following investment projects project a b c d are there c0 means cash flow in year zero which is nothing but initial investment each of them is a separate project don't mix them each of them is a separate project separate appraisal has to be done cash flows for year one year two and year three are given for all the projects separately these are all cash inflows that is why they are indicated with plus sign c naught cash outlay initial cash outlay is indicated by minus sign yes question says analyze and rank these projects according to each of the following methods first payback then arr arr will come to it later because arr is nothing to do with cash flows it will be generally the accounting profits irr and npv assuming discount rates of 10 percent and 30 percent and assuming these projects are independent which one should be accepted if the projects are mutually exclusive identify which project is the best project out of all so many questions are asked in one thing so such kind of questions were asked in the examination this is also a kind of past examination question all the calculations we have to do for each of the techniques separately for different different projects so npv also we have to calculate two npvs one is with 10 percent discount rate other one is with 30 percent discount rate so we can calculate each of them one by one first let us calculate payback period where the payback period will be for project a payback period is one year it is very easy and simple because 10,000 is initial investment entire money is coming back in first year itself and let me be clear once again if payback is asked payback only should be calculated don't tell that oh payback period is not scientific i will calculate discounted payback period no what is asked that is what you are supposed to calculate payback is asked calculate payback period discounted payback period is asked calculate discounted payback period but you cannot calculate something else according to your whims and fancies so here payback period is asked simple payback period that is one year in the first case that is project a so payback period can be easily calculated one year is the payback period for project a because within the end of first year the initial investment is coming back project b cumulative cash flows if you take 15,000 is there by the end of second year 
of course the third year doesn't have any cash flows so naturally the payback period for project b should be somewhere between first year and second year 10000 is to be covered by the end of first year only 7500 is covered that means still 2500 is supposed to be covered that 2500 divided by cash flows of second year are 7500 so 2500 divided by 7500 is one third that is 0 0.333 so 1.33 years we can say these are all years for second project third project first year 2000 second year 4000 means 6000 only covered but still 4000 is yet to be covered but how much is the cash flows of third year 12000 so 4000 divided by 12000 again 0.33 but here it is 2.33 because it is occurring between second and third years second year also the 10000 is not yet recouped so 2.33 years is the payback period for project c project d once again one year why entire 10000 is recovered in first year itself after that what happens in second year third year we don't care so these are the payback periods for each of the projects one year one one third years two one third years 2.33 years then project d also one year that is a payback period simple calculations but you have to show these calculations that is payback period arr will not calculate now you can understand it later that is again conrad shell so many possible calculations also will be there in that we'll come to that part later irr and npv we can definitely calculate for each of these uh, projects for that purpose NPV also is asked to be calculated assuming discount rates of 10% and 30% directly. So, we need these uh, calculations to be done definitely for maximum 4 years are there. So, let us just take 4 years. Amounts of course will change. So project A, for NPV, we can have here 0 also, because there are negative cash flows. Either way also it can be done, you can just calculate present value of all the cash inflows, then minus the initial cash outlay, that's okay, doesn't matter, that will be still no problem. But still, we can calculate this in the standard format everywhere, so here 10%. PBIFs are different, 30% PBIFs will be different. Uh, so first let us take the cash flows, first we are talking about project A, project A initial cash outlay is 10,000 and only cash flows happened in year 1 that is 10,000 that is all. So PBIF for year 0 will be 1, for year 1 it will be 1 divided by 1.1 because the rate is 10 percent 1 plus r so 1 divided by 1.1 is 9.909 that is a pvif so dcf at 10 uh, percent is different dcf at 30 percent will be naturally different Now, at 30% also for year 0 it will be 1 only. So, DCF at 10% or 30% year 0 will not have any difference. That will be still the same. 10,000 minus 10,000 that is multiplied with 1 will be same amount. You don't have to do that. Just showing. Don't do multiplied with 1 and all. Not required. Just same amount as initial cash outlay because present value of 1 rupee today is one that is the reason same amount will be there no need to do separately any calculations but 30 percent pvif is not going to be same it is going to be one divided by 1.3 30 percent means 1.3 so what is going to be the discounted cash flows there that pvif multiplied with the cash flow of that year that comes to 7692 that's all. 
second year, third year, fourth year, nothing is there. Even though they are there, we don't care about them because there is no cash flows at all. Only one year cash flow is there. So what is going to be the NPV here? NPV is going to be the sum of these things. If there are, there is nothing here. So the same thing will be the NPV. So for project A, at 10% DCF, it is uh, minus 909. At 30% DCF, it is minus 2308. That is the NPV. Now, we need IRR also. IRR is going to be definitely less than 10% because at 10% itself, project is already having a negative NPV. So, what is going to be the IRR of this project? Whatever the percentage it can be, it is still going to be negative only if you observe. Let us say if you take 1% as a discounting rate or IRR, even then also 10,000 will be less than 10,000. The present value of 10,000 will be definitely less than 10,000. There also NPV will be negative only. So there is no way for project A for NPV to be positive unless there is a negative time value of money which only happens in places like Japan which is completely different. So, it is impossible for the project A to have a positive NPV because initial cash outlay and cash flows are same. Only 10,000 is coming in. Present value of that will be less than 10,000 irrespective of whatever is rate. So, for project A, we don't or can't <coughs> calculate IRR. Just NPV can be just calculated. That is enough. That is for project A. NPV. So, there is not going to be any return, 0%. In fact, actually minus, but still, so there is nothing. We cannot have anything called minus. So, there is no return at all. There is no IRR at all for project A. And what is the NPV for project A? This is the thing that we calculated around 910 rupees, around 2310 rupees. That is NPV. That is for project A. Now, moving on to project B. Project B just changing here but you have to do it again so what are the cash flows for project b 7500 7500 so here 17500 again here 2 also 7500 what is going to be the pvif at 10% whatever earlier divided by 1.1 right here whatever is earlier divided by 1.3 so, do this on, on paper. So, the discounted cash flows are going to be like this for 10%. 7500 multiplied with PVIF. 7500 multiplied with PVIF at 10%. Here also, 7500 multiplied with that PVIF. 7500 multiplied with that PVIF. Total them, we have got NPV. 3017 and 207 that is the NPV of this uh, project B at two different discount rates around 3017, 207, 208 that this small differences uh, it do not matter but one point here for sure is this project is giving more than 30 percent IRR why because at 30% also, it still has some positive NPV. We want 0 means you still need to reduce the NPV, which means you still need to further increase the rate of discounting. We don't need to do that. Let us not go into all those. As I told earlier, generally, any two discount rates, any two NPVs are okay to find out IRR. Approximately 30% also we can say. It is going to be around 30%. But we can calculate that also by using the same formula using IRR formula. So, what is the rate definitely going to be? R1, R2, we have 10% plus 10 plus 10. It is not going to be between 10 and 30, but still we are using the same formula. Doesn't matter. There is not a problem. Little bit of difference can be there, but it will still give more or less the same type of answer. So, R1 is 10%, 10% plus NPV1. NPV1 is how much? 3017 divided by 
एन पी वी वन माइनस एन पी वी टू थ्री जीरो वन सेवन माइनस टू जीरो सेवन मल्टीप्लाइड विथ दिस हैज टू बी मल्टीप्लाइड विथ डिफरेंस बिटवीन आर टू एंड आर वन दैट इज ट्वेंटी परसेंट सो दैट इज एडेड टू ओरिजिनल टेन परसेंट सो वॉट इज गोइंग टू बी द आई आर आर अप्रॉक्सिमेटली परसेंटेज वाइज इज अराउंड थर्टी वन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट आर थर्टी टू परसेंट दैट्स ओके नो प्रॉब्लम अराउंड थर्टी वन पॉइंट फाइव और थर्टी टू परसेंट इज द आई आर आर फॉर दिस प्रोजेक्ट बी दैट्स एनफ वी डोंट हैव टू वेस्ट टाइम अगेन इन कैलकुलेटिंग एट थर्टी टू परसेंट समवेर इन बिटवीन ऑल दीज थिंग्स वी डोंट नीड टू डू अराउंड दिस अमाउंट इज ओके अराउंड दिस परसेंटेज इट्स ओके ऑलरेडी द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द स्प्रेड बिटवीन द परसेंटेजेस इज हाई So naturally, it will not be hundred percent accurate. No, no need to be also. You don't have to waste time there. Already the question itself asked ten percent and thirty percent returns you have to take. That itself gives an indication that IRR also can be calculated by using these two calculations only. We don't need any further calculations. Enough calculations. That is project B. NPV also, IRR also. NPV at two different uh, discount rates. IRR is around thirty one point five percent. That's it. Now. For project C, project C, we have to do it again. Project C cash flows will be different. What are the cash flows? Two thousand, four thousand, twelve thousand. Okay, two thousand, four thousand, twelve thousand. For there, nothing is there. Now discount rates are ten percent, thirty percent. Discount factors have to be calculated. What are is earlier divided by one point one here? What are is earlier divided by one point three here? And we can calculate the discounted cash flows. Multiplying the cash flows with the respective discount rate, like that. If we calculated, there is going to be NPV of four one four zero approximately for project C at ten percent minus six thirty three at thirty percent. So here one is plus one is minus. So here we cannot take three zero one seven. What is NPV one here? Four one four zero divided by four one four zero minus of minus. That will become plus, right? That multiplied with the difference between these two is twenty. That is guaranteed. That plus R one ten percent is always there. So around twenty seven point three percent. Around twenty seven percent is the IRR for project C. Around twenty six point five, it has come. That's okay. Around twenty seven percent, we can say that is project C IRR. That's it. It will not be exactly same. I have to understand the accuracy of IRR depends on the spread between these two rates. The spread is twenty percent, huge spread. So it will definitely not be accurate. It will be near to that, and that's okay. No need to waste time on having a Accurate answer for IRR, particularly when the discount rates spread is too high. It will be less accurate. We should accept that and move on. That's okay. But it cannot be very too much different from the final answer. See, twenty six point five percent, twenty seven percent is okay. Thirty two percent, thirty one point five percent is okay. That's only just a point five percent difference we are talking, which is okay. Two two percent, three three percent difference cannot be there. That much accuracy has to be maintained. If calculations are done correctly, definitely accuracy will automatically come. That is project C. Now we have project D. Project D. D has again different cash flows: ten thousand, three thousand, three thousand. So ten thousand, three thousand, three thousand. Three years only. Yeah, okay, not four years. Four. There is not required. Only three years. Details are given. Anyway. So we have the discount uh, factors already. We have the Uh, cash flows for project D now ten three three multiplying the cash flows with present value interest rate factors respectively we will get the NPVs like this three eight two four and eight three three so approximately three eight two four two one eight three three eight thirty one no problem that is the NPV of this project D at ten percent and thirty percent rates of discount. Now coming to the IRR, approximately we can directly calculate. Already it would have come around thirty-eight percent, thirty-seven point six, or 
38 percent you have to calculate that since we have taken here no this is going to be wrong what is npv1 here 3824 divided by npv1 minus npv2 multiplied with this so around 36 percent we got it is 37.6 percent reducing the trial and error method that's okay So 36 percent we got. So NPV1 is 3824 divided by NPV1 minus NPV2 multiplied with R2 minus R1 which is 20 plus R1 which is 10 gives approximately 36 percent. So here 37.6 percent has come. That's also okay no problem. Why? Because we have two positive NPVs. One negative one positive will give more accurate answer but we have both positive NPV. It still doesn't matter. That's still okay around 36 percent IRR we have. So point is we should have the answers approximately ready as far as payback period is concerned directly the answers will be there 1 year, 1.33 years, 2.33 years and 1 year that is payback period. IRRs, A has no IRR at all that is absolutely no nil return project. B has uh, around 30 percent, C has around 27 percent and D has around 37.6 percent. So if IRR is considered to be the decision making criteria, project D is better. If IRR is considered to be the decision making criteria. If NPV is considered to be the decision making criteria, then also what is the rate at which the discounting happens? NPV is not something which is just uh, hanging in the air. NPV at what rate is important? So NPV there are two rates here. At 10% which project is good? At 30% which project is good? So at 10 percent which project is good uh, out of all the projects this one project C has highest NPV at 10 percent whereas at 30 percent project D has highest NPV. So according to IRR also project D according to 30 percent discount rate also project D. So when project C will be better only when the discount rate is 10 percent that is the conclusion that we can write. And ranking is given according to this, uh, whatever is the best uh, possible rank given to that project. So for payback period, A gets the first rank, D also gets the first rank, C is a little longer, B is the second rank, C is the third rank. ARR we are not, we are not done. For uh, IRR method, A is fourth rank, zero return, D is the first rank, B is next 30% something. C is around 27 percent. So that is third rank like that. NPV at 10 percent C is best. NPV at 30 percent D is best and other projects are ranked according to their respective NPVs and IRRs. That is the point here. So finally if <coughs> the projects are mutually exclusive then with 30 percent discount rate definitely D is the best. If a 10 percent discount rate is used then B is the best sorry C is the best. So that's all. So at 10 percent if at all you have to choose only one project mutual exclusive means you don't have an option. At 10 percent C is best because it has got highest NPV. At 30 percent D is best and I told you already while taking decision always NPV should be the criteria. IRR is not the better criteria. When, when compared with IRR, NPV is always a better technique. So at 10 percent C, 30 percent D. That is the final answer. For the selection, if at all, we have to choose only one project out of all. A and B are not good because A and B are always having their ranks either second, third, fourth rank only. Never they got first rank. Only in payback period, A got first rank. But that doesn't make sense. You spend now 10,000, get next year 10,000 back. Why should you do that project? Because next year 10,000 value will be less than the current 10,000 that you have spent. So even considering that time value of money, that A is completely useless project. That is a problem with payback period method as we discussed. That does not consider time value of money. That is why it gives A project also as number one rank. By mistake, if somebody chooses these things, they may go with A and D instead of going with B and C, whereas C is a fantastic project actually. Uh, so that is a problem with payback period. NPV is definitely of course the best technique and whichever project gives highest possible NPV should be chosen. 
when of course the initial cash outlay is anyway same if you observe all the projects initial cash outlay is 10000 only only the project cash flows are changing initial cash inflows are changing all others are going to be same that is uh, one of the applications of all the techniques in one question such kind of questions can be given given also earlier in the examinations for 10 marks where you have to do the calculations and show them carefully and elaborately with proper presentation and accuracy which matters more and final conclusion also will get couple of marks so if you just ignore the final conclusion also you will lose the marks you should be able to interpret the results as well not just calculating however only if it is asked don't give your valuable opinion if it is not asked if it is asked then only you will have to calculate and then show the interpretations otherwise if it is only asked to calculate just calculate enough don't give any advice decision etc i think i feel such kind of words should never be used always the decision or advice should be in the passive voice preferably that too in the third person not about first person or second person i and you will not be used it just has to be mentioned in passive voice so if 10 percent is the discount rate or if 10 percent is the uh, required rate of return project c is better if 30 percent is the required rate of return project d is better because it has better npv simple like that simple sentences have to be framed and written this this big big paragraph need not be written don't don't try to replicate these things not required it is only for your your understanding these are explained in detail in the examination all that you need to do is give a straightforward conclusion and why are you giving that naturally when and because npv is higher that's it so conclusion and reason for conclusion has to be written in a very simple format two three lines max no paragraphs no stories there that was illustration 15. now moving on to illustration 16 the expected cash flows for three projects are given below cost of capital is 10 percent question is asking calculate the payback period net present value irr and arr also arr we will calculate later at least payback period net present value irr we can calculate arr why i am not uh, worried about now is because of the difference between all other techniques and arr so we are talking about cash flows here when we are talking about the cash flows arr is not in the scene arr uses not cash flows it uses accounting profits so the input data itself cannot be same for all these techniques no for payback period npv irr for all of them input is cash flows for arr input is not cash flows it is accounting profits how can you use the same data for calculating arr in this case it is given only because for practice purposes but technically the input data is not same for all the techniques only for arr it is going to be different that is why in general it cannot be mixed with the other techniques all other techniques can be used with the same kind of inflow data that is cash inflows data so project a b c these are all there and a and b are having 10 years life whereas c is having four years life only once again on npv basis also it is not prudent to compare the projects with unequal lives that is not correct because projects with unequal lives is altogether a, a different topic. Because the point has come, let us move on to that topic for understanding how the treatment should be when the projects are having unequal lives. So the projects having unequal lives also will create a kind of uh, disparity between uh, NPV and IRR. Taking an example given in illustration 12, let us say MVA Limited is considering two projects A and B. Cash flows associated with these projects are given like this. Project A is having only one year life. Project B is having three years lives. Means these two projects are having unequal lives. So what will be the IRR and what will be the NPV of these two projects? We can calculate. For NPV, we need the discount rate that is given as 12%. So, according to both the techniques NPV and IRR, which project is better if we analyze? 
the results will be like this you have to do these calculations same way like we do for any other question every time there is no new procedure so for project a the npv is 169750 whereas for project b npv is 336400 so that is the npv at 12% discount rate so naturally by looking at npv numbers project b looks better than project a particularly when they are mutually exclusive and that too when their initial cash outlay is same so b is definitely far better project than a when if we look at the npv but if at all we calculate irr in this case it is unusually high you can do this calculation for project a and project b with different discount rates maybe you can take as high as 50% discount rate also so at 50% discount rate the irr of project a <coughs> is going to be 50% because npv is almost zero near to zero that is for project a so in other words we can say the irr for project a is 50% whereas for project b irr is 43% approximately in other words definitely the project b irr is less than project a irr so once again there is a contradiction in ranking so there were three different scenarios we have seen where the contradiction between npv and irr will exist one in case the projects are of different scale where the initial cash outlay is two different one small budget project one one big budget project that can cause contradiction of ranking between npv and irr second case timing of the cash flows can definitely have an impact on the contradiction between npv and irr third one lives of the projects if they are unequal then also npv and irr can give contradictory results so that is the unequal lives situation now coming back to the question what we were doing earlier where the unequal lives are there for three projects for project a and b there is no issue a and b are having equal lives but c is having lesser life only 4 years but what is the requirement here simply payback period net present value irr and arr arr limit let us calculate payback period npv and irr for all these projects with the data that is given in the question cost of capital is 10% right so definitely it requires a bit of more calculations than normal because the lives are little longer but usually in the examination that much long lives will not be given these are all for practice but that does not mean you have to leave them you have to practice more so that you become more adept in the computations and you become more and more accurate also so let us take each of the projects uh, one by one let us take project a first so cash flows will be naturally different we have to input them and uh, the cost of capital is 10% so the pvifs have to be also calculated for 10% you can refer to the tables also so 1 divided by 1.1 that divided by 1.1 and so on so these are the <coughs> pvifs at 10% for 10 years cash flows project a we are talking 0th year minus 5000 later on we have to input them all are having 900 900 so for this project there is actually a possibility of using the annuity factor 
but even then we need this calculation because you have to calculate payback period also so only npv can be calculated directly but payback period anyway you need cumulative cash flows so for that purpose let us continue with all the 10 years cash flows all equal 900 900 900 each year so this should be zero at year yeah PYF for 0 ether is going to be 1. And all the other 10 years, 900 is going to be the cash inflows. Now let us calculate uh, discounted cash flows. First, let us calculate NPV. Multiplying the cash flows with the PYF, we will get discounted cash flows. Naturally, it will be same for the year 1. Whereas for all the other years, you have to do the multiplication. Adding all of them, we will get an NPV positive of 530. For project A, NPV is 530. That is the answer as far as NPV is concerned. NPV for A, yeah, it can be directly calculated also, no need of all this. But still, 530 approximately. Payback period for A also can be calculated directly with the equation because the cash flows are anyway uniform. Initial investment is 5000. Cash flows are uniform, 900. So how many years it will take to recoup 5000? 5000 divided by 900. So there also it is easy. Payback period also can be directly calculated 5.56 years simple directly the initial outlay divided by uniform cash flow so when there are uniform cash flows calculations will become simpler 5.56 years is the payback period for project a npv is 530 rupees that we calculated <clears throat> now we can even calculate irr since this is a positive npv this is r1 10 percent is r1 let us take another rate where there will be negative NPV. Conservatively, let us take 20% because the amounts are very small but still the NPV is still high. So let us take 20% and let us recalculate the PVIFs and discounted cash flows. Year 0 it is going to be same. Year 1 it is going to be same. Oh, sorry, year 0, the discounted cash flows are also going to be same. But the PVIF is going to be different at 20%. So, 1 divided by 1.2. That divided by 1.2 and so on. In fact, we can use PVIF A in this case also. But we are just using the same format for convenience. Then if you multiply the cash flows with this, these discount factors, what is going to be the NPV at 20%? Yeah, it is big minus. That is 1227 rupees. If you take 15% also, could be different. You can even take 15%. These are all trial and error things only. But anyway, as I said in the examinations, you don't have to worry about these things because usually it will be easier to find out which rates to be used for IRR also according to the tables that are given in the question itself. So let, let us take 15%. Still the NPV is negative, which is okay for us. So NPV1 is 530, NPV2 is 483. IRR formula we know R1 plus NPV1 divided by NPV1 minus NPV2. So what is NPV1 minus NPV2? First of all, that is the denominator 1013. NPV1 divided by NPV1 minus NPV2 is 0 0.52. That plus R1 is 10%. So IRR for this project is going to be 10.5% approximately. So IRR for project A. We took 10 or 12. Ten 
10 only. This is 15. Since the spread between the discount rates is larger, the accuracy definitely is compromised. So if we take 12% and then maybe something like 13%, then 1 minus 1 plus can be there. Again, all these permutations, combinations need not be done. Approximate answers in the examination conditions are okay. So at 12 percent also there is a positive NPV. So definitely IRR is going to be more than 12 percent. So it, 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 it is not going to be less than 12 percent because even at 12 percent discount rate also NPV is positive. So if you take for example 13 percent discount rate, how much is the NPV here? 85. Let us just remember that if you take 13 percent instead of that, one divided by 1.13, that divided by 1.13 and so on. This is minus 116. So 85 is NPV1, minus 116 is NPV2. So it can be just uh, calculated. <coughs> NPV1. 85 divided by NPV 185 minus of minus becomes plus 116 multiplied with the difference is between 12 and 13 is just 1 percentage so 12 plus something only is there so 85 plus 116 is 201 so 85 by 201 plus 12 percent it is more accurately 12.42 percent we can say that is IRR for project A. So NPV, IRR, payback period all the three for project A we have calculated payback period is 5.56 years NPV for project A is 530 at 10 percent discount rate IRR is around 12.42 percent that is all for project A. Now moving on to project B. Look at the cash flows once again. We have to recalculate for project B. Cash flows minus 5000 is common then the yearly cash flows are different. So copy them carefully. 700, 800, 900,000, 1100, 1200, 1300, 1400, each, each year 100 is increasing. So here it is easy but you have to do it on paper. So 1600 in the last year, 10th year. Now if you Calculate the NPV. You cannot use the annuity factor because the cash flows are not uniform. You have to use definitely the PVIFs at 10% and then multiply them. Then the NPV is coming out to be 1590 approximately. So 1590 or 1591 is the NPV for project B. Whereas for project B, IRR also. Let us calculate. Because at 13 percent already we have got still positive. Let us take 15 percent. See this IRR is always like a trial and error method. It will have its own limitations. We have to accept that there is no option. 
15 percent if you take what is going to be the NPV here? Still positive. Fifteen percent also still positive. So two eleven is the NPV at fifteen percent. Let us take sixteen percent. Thirteen negative. So approximately 16% we can say 13 is not a big number. So for project B, approximately IRR is going to be around 16%. So 15.94% or 16% we can say. Very small difference is there. So that is IRR for project B. Or it can be calculated also, no problem. Still it will come to around 16%. That is for project B IRR. Then what about the payback period for project B. That is an important point that can be identified by calculating the cumulative cash flows for project B. We have to cover how much? 5000 rupees. That is initial cash outlay. Cumulative cash flows for project B have to be calculated where it is crossing 700 plus 800 plus 900 plus 1000 plus 1100 plus 1200. So it is between 5 to 6 years. So up to 5 years, cumulative cash flows are 4,500 and after adding the 6th year's cash flows, they are 5,700. So somewhere between 5,000 is there, which means payback period is between 5 to 6 years. So definitely it is 5 plus. 5 plus what? How much more to be covered? 500 divided by what are the cash flows of the 6th year? 1,200. Or difference between the cumulative cash flows is also same, 1,200. So 500 by 1,200 plus 5. That is 5.42 years. That is the payback period for project B. 5.42 years. So project B we have payback period. We have NPV and IRR. This is around 16%. That is for project B. Then project C is having a different life altogether. We have to calculate all the three things once again for project C. C is having only four years life. So all the other data becomes irrelevant. Only four years life it has. So 5000 is okay, same zero eighth year. Then the cash flows if you see 2221, 2000, 2000, 2000, 1000. These are the cash inflows for project C. At 10%, same discount factors are there and multiplying the cash flows with the discount factors. At 10%, we have got 657 NPV for project C, approximately. 655, 657, whatever. That is project C NPV. Then for project C, IRR can also be calculated since just for understanding here there is 16 percent already there also still there is positive NPV 16 percent 44 let us take 17 percent negative 40 47 so once again 44 47 so 16 plus 44 divided by 44 minus of minus becomes plus between 16 and 17 the difference is only 1 so that is not required so 44 plus 47 is 91 so 44 divided by 91 plus 16 percent approximately 16.5 percent that is the IRR for project C approximately 16.5 percent yeah so these are the various results for project A, B and C. And if you can keep all of them as a summary here, for project A, payback period is 5.5 years, project B it is 5.4 years, project C, project C payback period we have not calculated, we still have to calculate that. That can be calculated from the cash flows itself easily. 
because cumulative cash flows can be calculated there itself for project C. 5,000 has to be covered. At uh, third year, 6,000 is already there. So between three to four years, between two to three years, the payback period will be already here 4,000, here 6,000. So 4,000 to 5,000 remaining to be covered is 1,000 and that uh, year's cash flows are 2,000 plus 2 means 2.5 years is going to be the payback period for project C. So all the results can be summarized here. Again, I'm repeating this is only for practice. You have to practice these things. By watching, you will not get anything. You have to put pen on paper and do all these calculations with different different uh, permutations, combinations, particularly for IRR. Though it is not required for examinations, don't worry about that. This is only for practice. So payback period is 5.5 years, 5.4 years, 2.5 years. NPV as we already calculated 530, around 1590 and 655. IRR 12.42, 15.94, 16.52. So looking at the ranking, if you take payback period as the criteria, C is the best and next comes B, next comes A. If you take NPV as the criteria, B is the best, next comes C, next comes A. If you take IRR as a criteria, C is the best, next comes B, next comes A. So again, we can understand here, there is a conflict between NPV and IRR. So project C, NPV is 655, project A is only 530. B is giving the best possible NPV. If these projects are mutually exclusive, then we can say project B is better. However, if you take IRR as a basis, then definitely the results are different. C is giving a better IRR. Why is that? Because C is giving more cash flows initially because the total project life itself is 4 years. Other projects are having lot of cash flows after 4 years also. But C is having all the cash flows within 4 years itself. So because of that C is having better IRR. Still it is not a good project to be selected considering NPV as the basis. But can we take NPV of B and C as they are? Calculations is one thing that is over. Calculations is one part that we have done already. ARR forget about it. We will come to that later. Whereas for uh, <coughs> analysis purposes, A, B are having equal lives and C is having a completely different life. So is it ideally, is it ideal and is it correct to compare these two? projects like B and C or A and C. No, it is not. When the projects are having unequal lives, NPVs in absolute terms cannot be compared. So NPV also should not be just like that compared. That is a special scenario. One of the special scenarios that we have here is that. That is projects having unequal lives. So one of the things that we observed in the projects with unequal lives is there can be a conflict of ranking between the NPV and IRR. That is one thing. But another point is also there when the projects are having unequal lives. The NPV cannot be compared just like that because the lives are not same. So whenever we have projects with unequal lives, there is one more extra point that we have to look at where we have to take the equivalent annualized criteria. So equivalent annualized criteria means we cannot take NPV as it is. We have to take equalized annual NPV. On an average, every year how much NPV it is generating has to be calculated. Then only they can be compared. Just for understanding, look at this example with uh, project A and project B. Uh, different uh, cash flows are there. Project A is having six years life. Project B is having only three years life. So NPV of the project A is this much, NPV of project B is this much, already calculated. But you can calculate also for practice, 12% rate you use, find out NPV of project A and project B and check whether these answers are correct or not. They should be, but you have to do the practice, right? So that you have to do. IRR of the projects is like this. So if you look at the first problem we already faced. NPV criteria tells us project A is better, IRR criteria tells us project B is better. 
that is one of the contradictions between npo and irr when the project lives are unequal then how to solve this problem that is a, that is the point here we know there is a problem there will be contradiction in other cases where the lives are equal and generally the scale is equal projects are mutually exclusive if the npv and irr are having conflict there we can simply go with npv we don't have to worry about irr but with the projects having unequal lives straight away we cannot say that because npvs are also not comparable npv of project a looks high but is it generating annual npv higher maybe not so for that purpose we have to calculate equalized annual benefit in this case npv sometimes we may have to calculate equalized annual cost if there are no benefits given only only costs are given in the question so this is the equalized annual approach which has to be used for comparison of the projects with unequal lives particularly for npv irr is okay leave it for npv also it is not comparable when the projects are having unequal lives how to do that equalized annual npv simple whatever npv we have divided by you may think that number of years no it should not be number of years it should be the annuity factor for that number of years at that particular rate of discount annuity factor so pvifa has to be the denominator numerator is npv so in this case if we take the pvifa for 12% for project a we have to take 6 years 12% whereas for project b we have to take 3 years 12% so those can be checked in the tables also they can be calculated also so at 12% pvaf that is pvifa annuity factor present value annuity factor is 4.112 at 12% for 6 years for 3 years it is 2.402 npv is already are there so what we are calculating here equivalent or equalized annual annualized criteria so what is the equivalent annual npv equalized annual benefit we can call it equalized annual npv we can call it how much is that A is giving only one five seven eight five four average per annum, whereas B is giving on an average per annum two one four six not eight. So even from NPV criteria, project B should be selected, but not A. IRR criteria anyway says B is better. Anyway, it is giving B as a better choice. But even from NPV criteria also, B is better because this is a special case of projects having unequal lives where we cannot compare the just raw npvs of one project with another project we have to calculate equalized annual npv so what are the steps here in this case first normal npv just calculate normally then present value annuity factor generally will be given in the question and then divide a with b so step a step b divided by step b in other words npv whatever we calculated divided by pvifa technical name you can just call it as pvaf present value annuity factor main care has to be taken percentage may be same but number of years are different so pvifa for 6 years is different for 3 years is different respectively according to the lives of the projects those pvifas have to be taken and we have to calculate equalized annual npv this is a benefit so we can call it as equalized annual benefit annual benefit is where higher for project b it is higher so project b should be selected so that is the special case of projects with unequal lives and this applies to any situation where we face the projects with unequal lives so coming back to this uh, same question where we have this uh, a b c projects what is the equalized annual npv though it is not calculated straight away can we say b is better than c from npv criteria answer is no definitely not a anyway npv is very less so forget about a naturally the conflict is coming between which which projects here b and c between b and c a is ruled out a is not so good okay payback period is high npv is low compared with other two projects irr is also low compared with other two projects so what is the use of a useless project so forget about it naturally the conflict if at all these projects are mutually exclusive will be between b and c c looks good for payback type and c also looks from irr type irr Uh, criteria only c is not looking good with npv criteria is it correct to compare b and c just like that b is having 1591 c 
C is having 655 NPV, so B is better because NPV is a better technique than IRR. That is all normal conditions, but not for projects with unequal lives. That is the main point here. So these two cannot be compared. 1591 cannot be compared with 655. What we should do? We should divide present value additive factor at the cost of capital, whatever it is. So we have that. You can refer to the tables also. Okay, let us recalculate it. That is easier. So present value annuity factor at what percentage? What was the percentage of NPV that we calculated? 10%, right? So NPV was always calculated at 10%. So 10%, 10 years, 10%, 4 years, annuity factors we have to calculate. So 1 divided by 1.1, that divided by 1.1, like this, 10 years. We have to take. Don't worry about these many decimals. You don't have to do all of that. Just stick to three or four maximum decimals for PVIFs. That also will not be required because that will be given in the question mostly. So, what is the total of all this? Ten years. Total of all this is six point one four five. So, that is the PVIF or PVIFA at ten percent for ten years. Six point 145 that is for project B whereas for 4 years how much it is only 4 years 1 2 3 4 just total 4 of them 3.17 now find out equalized annual benefit from project B 1591 divided by 6.145 it is coming to approximately 259 rupees 260 rupees you can say 655 divided by 3.17 it is coming to 655 divided by 2.317 coming to 206 rupees or 207 rupees approximately so here also project b is good so in this particular case equalized annual npv also is better for project b so 1591 divided by 6.145 is giving better equalized annual NPV when compared with C. Now we can conclude taking NPV as a criteria, B is better project. Equalized annual NPV also, normal NPV also. So B is better project from NPV criteria. Whereas IRR if it is a criteria and payback period if it is a criteria, C is the better project. These all things are required only if decision is asked. Otherwise, computations are enough. And finally, ranking, comparison, summary of this, uh, all computations, you should also give in the examination if there are many projects. Then uh, ranking, if it is asked, you give this type of table also. If it is not asked, no need. Just computations are enough. Interpretation and final decision also will be required only and only if the question is particularly asking such kind of conclusion. Otherwise, simple computations will be enough that is about various other techniques also in this chapter investment decision making or capital budget that is the crux of this chapter of course two more things are there that is arr and mirr both are little different so we'll discuss about them later after first of all becoming thorough with the existing things that we already know so what are all the things that we already learned in this chapter, computation, interpretation, etc. Payback period, payback reciprocal, then NPV, IRR, discounted payback period and profitability index. So all these techniques have to be thoroughly understood. But one point should be again remembered 
most of the things that we are doing here so far as far as part of the learning process is concerned from the ICA material these are for practice the actual questions that will be given that were given in the examinations will be there at the end of the chapter so these questions are the examination type of questions but to reach there first of all we should be thorough with the concepts that is the reason why lot of practice is required pen on pa paper is the most important aspect if you do these things on computer or if you do these things in the brain or on just calculators it is not going to be useful in the examinations you will almost make mistakes and lose marks so that accuracy is not something that you can attain on the day of examination that you have to understand it is possible to be achieved only with tremendous practice that's all and because you don't have the facility of doing these things on computer you have to do them on the calculator with pen on paper with proper tables and then taking the PVIFs or PVIFAs directly from the question if they are given if not you can refer to tables there you can save time if, you, if it is taking lot of time for you to compute PVIFs and PVIFAs that's okay don't worry there you can refer to the tables tables are there in the institute material anyway so there you can save some time but other calculations multiplications additions which factor has to be taken all these things have to be practiced well then only you will get uh, better understanding and thoroughness and then only you will get better marks from this chapter 10 marks question is almost guaranteed from this sometimes 15 marks also 10 marks big question and 5 marks small question also can be asked so very very important chapter huge scoring chapter and it, what is the risk here in this type of questions is naturally accuracy procedurally major complications will not be there accuracy is the crucial aspect that has to be maintained and that will come only and only with practice that's all fine then we'll conclude today's session with that and in the next session we'll continue with uh, more problem solving related to the techniques that we already know from the examination point of view what kind of problems were asked and uh, can be asked those type of questions little bigger ones also we will solve in the next session till then take care bye bye thank you very much